May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Abide. It means to dwell, to live in, to remain, to rest in. Abide. Abide in Christ's love. Live there. Dwell there. Abide. Going back to the Greek, some translate John 1.14, and the word became flesh and lived among us, as the word became flesh and pitched a tent among us. It's a lovely image that harkens back to the tabernacle that was pitched and moved with the Israelites as they wandered in the wilderness after the exodus from Egypt. God came and tabernacled with them, moved with them, wandered with them, even in the desert. In Jesus, God came to dwell among us, to abide, to pitch a tent in our midst, even when we wander in the wilderness. And now in John 15, as Jesus prepares the disciples for his death, resurrection, and ascension in a lengthy farewell address, he urges them to pitch their tents in love. So the question that we are asked today is where do we dwell? Where do we live? Where do we pitch our tents? Is it in the love of God or in anger, in judgment, in anxiety, in addiction or hatred? Where do we and our hearts dwell? Today's gospel reading urges us to pick up the tents we've pitched in some unworthy place and to move them so that we are abiding in love. The word is agape, unconditional love that actively seeks the good of the other. And how do we do that? Jesus tells us that if we follow his commands, we will abide in his love and our joy will be complete. And what is his command? To love as he has loved us, to serve others as he has just illustrated by washing his disciples' feet, and to lay down our lives, to spend our lives actively seeking the good of others, not out of our own reserves or strength, but by drawing on the unconditional love that God has for each of us. And this is not a dreary task, but rather something that will make our lives overflow with joy. We're going to fast forward a bit to Acts now. Before he died, Jesus promised that he would continue to be present even after he had left earth through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit would comfort and accompany and work on behalf of Jesus' disciples and mark them as his own. And in Acts, the Holy Spirit is the star of the show. It comes in wind, in fire, and pours out grace and power and even miracles. They were plopped into the dramatic conclusion of the story, and you really need the full story to get the real impact. So I urge you to read Acts 10, or maybe the whole book when you get a chance, but I'll summarize it for you briefly. A Roman centurion, Cornelius, has heard of Jesus and is a righteous man, praying and giving alms constantly. One day he is praying, and perhaps greatly to his surprise, God shows up and answers him and tells him to go to Simon Peter. Only problem, Cornelius is a Gentile, and Jewish law forbids Jews from having anything to do with Gentiles. In fact, Gentiles are considered unclean, which means they were not able to come into the presence of God and could make anyone who associated with them too closely unclean and also unable to enter the temple and God's inmost presence. For early Jewish followers of Jesus, the idea of a Gentile being a disciple of Jesus and belonging intimately to God would have been unthinkable. And intermingling with Gentiles would have been a repugnant thought. But of course, the spirit blows where it wills. And God is too big for anything that would seek to come between God and any part of God's beloved creation. So God sends a vision to Peter to show him that even Gentiles are beloved by God. 
The vision has just wrapped up as Peter hears a knock on the door. It is a summons to go to the house of a Gentile, the house of Cornelius. When he arrives, Peter says, you yourselves know that it is improper for a Jew to associate with or visit an outsider, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. And the Gentiles who have gathered at Cornelius' house ask for Peter to tell them the story of Jesus. Peter says, I truly understand that God shows no partiality. And then he preaches the good news, the gospel to them. And now our dramatic ending. In the middle of his sermon, the Spirit shows up and pours out gifts on the Gentiles. And the Jewish believers are shocked that even Gentiles, unbaptized, uncircumcised, ritually unclean people are in fact intimately embraced by God. As the Spirit falls on them, these outsiders are marked as God's own beloved friends to use the words from John 15. The baptisms that follow are not simply a way of marking conversions, but are a sign of full and complete inclusion in the community. As they are accepted and beloved by God, they are also to be fully included and accepted by the community of believers who once thought them, thought that the good news and the gifts of the Spirit were meant only for them. I did not purposely plan for our RIC Sunday focused on immigration and this remarkable scripture passage to fall on the same day. But I think it is no coincidence, probably, that this scripture passage shows up in our lectionary this week. Maybe it's even an act of the Holy Spirit. Who are the outsiders in our world today? Who are those we still are tempted to call unclean and not worth associating with? Those whose accents or language or skin color mark them as different frequently experience that sense of being othered and not seen as fully human, as fellow children of God, as friends of God. I believe that the Spirit is still working in our churches today and throughout the world, working to remind us that the church is meant to be that place that names all of God's creation as beloved, that breaks down barriers. I believe the Spirit is calling to us today and is asking us where we are pitching our tents. In hatred or fear or a desire to exclude or in agape. Where are we abiding? God has already marked everyone we may wish to call unclean as beloved. God has already pitched a tent with them. Will we pitch our tent alongside God's in love? Peter ends his sermon not by going home, but by staying in the very home of the Gentiles he once would have refused to associate with in any way. As theologian A. Catherine Grebe says, in case we missed the point, the last line of the story underlines it for us one more time. Then they invited him to stay for several more days. The inclusion of the Gentiles is not a reluctant, perfunctory toleration of the new group. Full inclusion implies getting to know them, hearing their stories, accepting hospitality from them in their homes, and sharing the same table. That is what it means to abide in Christ's love, to share the same table, to hear, to learn, to change, to remember that those we might wish to call they or other belong to. And those we might wish to exclude don't just belong to God. We belong to one another. Will we hear what the Spirit is saying to us? Will we pitch our tents smack dab in the midst of an active, unconditional love that works on behalf of one another's good? Will we build a larger table and be the church the Spirit started building so long ago in Cornelius' living room as Jew and Gentile came together and learned to abide in love together? I hope we answer that question with a resounding yes. Amen.